template toolkit. It is a fabulous and well-established pro module for taking a data structure and a template and putting them together to produce some kind of output. Um, now that sounds really trivial and half the people in the room are thinking, why would you do that? And the other half are thinking, oh, I can do that myself. And the answer is you would do that because doing it with print statements is horrible the minute you have to change anything and doing it yourself is really limited compared to what this will do for you. Um, what the template toolkit is, I just did that, why it's useful. Template toolkit really lets you take a data structure and turn it into lots of different kinds of output. And one of the cool tricks with Catalyst is that you often use template toolkit with it. And it's really easy to say, okay, I'm using this template, I get HTML. I'm using this template, I get XML. I'm using this template, I don't, you have to do something different to get JSON. But it, it's, it's really easy to say, here's my data, format it for something. Um, we'll show how to use it and then I have a, a slide full of all the good resources for it. There's plenty of good information about it around. Uh, template Toolkit is a templating system. Pretty obviously does what it says in the tin. It's written in Perl. It's very fast. It's been around a really long time and yet it's still being updated. There are several places on the web they'll say, oh no, it's dead, nobody still uses that. Not really. Uh, that may be a typo, in fact. It may have been updated this year, but it, it's pretty current. Lots of work going on and lots of people using for a lot of things. Um, there's a bunch of features Template Toolkit has that I'm not going to go into here tonight. Um, it handles caching and um, buffering and does a whole bunch of stuff so that it doesn't have to re-render templates if it doesn't need to. If you're doing you know, high, high, high speed websites that get a ton of hits, it will be your friend. Um, the real question of why a template? Why would you do that? You want to separate your calculation from your display because I guarantee somebody's going to come along and say, oh yeah, can you change this? Can you reverse those columns? Can you make this blue? Can you make this bigger? Can you break it out this way? Can you send it in plain text? Can you send that in email? And once you have the data, Template Toolkit makes it much simpler to format in all the different ways you need and to adjust the formatting without breaking all your, your code. Um, it's also easier to work with templates. It is possible you could give a set of templates to somebody who knows HTML and let them work on them. Whereas if they have to work on Perl, they're lost. Possible. You can write templates that are too hard. Here's some ugly code. Can you read this? Yeah, I made it bigger than last time. I, I hope you can read this. This is old code I found in a CGI script lurking in my home directory um, that did some work to read some log files, which I didn't even show. And here it is printing out HTML, generating an, a, a web page. This was CGI circa 1999. It was exciting. And it was monitoring how badly my web server was getting hit with NIMDA. So that tells you when it was, when I wrote this. And I haven't touched it since. But it goes through and it, 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 it did some work to j build some variables and I didn't even put them in a hash. They were just individual scalars. And then I had an array. Oh, I actually had a, a hash of IPs that had a count of how many times each IP had hit. And this is very typical code for a lot of people to have written. Half the people in the room again are thinking, oh, I wouldn't have written that in 20 years, but lots of people write this kind of code, trust me and maintaining it's no fun. And somebody will say, add a column to that table. And then you have to find all the print statements that generate that table. And it's harder than it sounds. I love the tab before the table runs, as if a human was gonna be reading your HTML. I used to care a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some much cleaner code that uses HTML template. And this is the code you say use template. You get a new template object and you tell it where to get your templates from. You build a hash, a hash ref of all your data. That's one little difference between that old code and what would be shiny new code is you should put it all in one data structure. And, I, and I'm, we're skipping all that stuff here because I can't read those log files anymore, they're gone. And then you call template process and you give it the name of the template and all your data. And it puts those things together and spits out all your output for you. And all your data generation is right here where magic occurs. And all your output is down here 
and you don't have to care. Here's what the template looks like to generate that same web page that we saw a minute ago. And as you can see, it looks more like HTML. There's some special markup going on to say start and end and counts. But then there's just some HTML stuff with HTML template magic going on in the middle of it. Um, but you can see here that it's a table and that it has rows and headers. There's a loop here that will print out everything in the array. Uh, and this, this actual sample winds up having some real magic in it that I hope we will have covered by all of the end of the slides. But it, it's, it's not necessarily a trivial example because I have to call functions on a hash ref to get the size and to get the keys and to sort them and to do the right stuff to make it format just like it did in, in the web page. But a lot of that you can push out into your template and don't have to do in your data. Template Toolkit has tools to do common things like sort and take a hash ref and get the list of keys so you can iterate over them. All the kinds of stuff you're gonna wanna do to take a piece of data and turn it into a, 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 a piece of output. The data builds your output. That's the important part. And it, it takes a little bit of thinking differently if you're used to just gathering up all your stuff and printing it out as you go. You need to scrape all your data into a pile and then hand it to Template Toolkit. Now, for me right now, that's really easy because I've been doing a lot of work in Catalyst lately where you have all this whole framework that lets you scrape your data into a pile and then give it to a view and you're done. And your views are probably Template Toolkit. So there's a whole bunch of things that I, I, I just naturally think of that way, but it, it takes a little getting used to. Generally, you want to put everything into a hash ref. And if you have lists, you put them in an array ref in your hash ref. If you have structured data, it can go inside a hash ref in your hash ref and you can split those out by item, by key, or, or iterate through the whole array. And you can do that right in the description of your template. If you have the same data, you can build multiple templates. You're on your web store and you've just finished your transaction and you can use it to print out their receipt and you can take that same data set and feed it to a different uh, template and send them an email. An email actually usually takes two templates. If you wanna do it right, please do it right because you need an HTML part so that people think you actually know what you're doing and you need a plain text part so that when people look at it on their phone or dumb devices, it's still actually readable. Um, you can, I've also seen template toolkit used to generate comma separated, tab separated, XML. I've seen it pushed to do JSON, but that's a little harder and you probably want to make it work. Please don't use template toolkit to generate XML. <sighs> yes. Um, <laughs> I've seen it done, it's probably not the right answer. It's definitely not the right answer. There are other tools in the toolbox for that one. Yeah. Um, I'm a little ahead of my slides here. Build your data, put it in a hash ref, create a template toolkit object, tell it where your templates are, and tell it to process your template. And some frameworks will do parts of these things for you. Sometimes you have to do it all yourself. None of those steps should be too hard. Build data is the hard part, and that's your problem. Uh, you have to do that yourself. I don't know what your program has to print. Here's your data, it goes in a hash ref. Yeah, you can use scalars for individual items that'll be just replaced in the template. You can use array refs. You can loop over everything in that array and generate a list or a table. You can dig deeper into hash refs. You can put an object in and call methods on that object right from inside your template. Um, so you can do some really amazing things by sticking an object in there and then calling methods on it and having it go run Perl as your, as your template is being generated. A scalar is the easiest item to deal with in, a, in the data item. Oh, these windows are all too small to read. Here we have a hash. This is the Perl program you want to start with. This is the template you're working on. Template toolkit blocks. I thought I had a slide on this. Am I out of order? They start with square brackets and percent signs. That's the notation that it uses in its parser to say, hey, I need to look at the stuff inside here. And then it looks for all of the keywords it knows and they have to be in uppercase. You can change that, but it'll drive you crazy. Anything that's in lowercase or mixed case, it wants to look for as a variable. So when you see, you know, square bracket percent thing, 
percent square bracket, it's just going to look in the hash ref for uh, a, an entry called thing, and it's going to replace it with that value. So you give it a simple template like this, and it's going to produce some very simple output. Just simple token replacement. Now, if that's all it did, I'd tell you to write it yourselves, but it does way more than that. For array references, you put an array reference in your hash, you refer to it in your template, you can loop over it. There are a couple of different mechanisms to loop over it. There's while loops and for each loops. You say for each item in this hash, or yeah, for each item in this hash, and every, or in this array, it goes through the array and assigns this variable to the, the item of the array it's processing. It's kind of like each. And it does that in a block, so you can print out a whole list of things. One note, yes, you can see it on this slide if you look really closely. I have not run these samples. I keyed them into Keynote, which means these are all using smart quotes, which look great on the screen, but it perlates. So this, you won't be able to copy and paste this because I just keyed them in like mad and smart quote. I noticed three quarters of the way through that I was getting the happy little curly quotes and it's, it looks okay, but it's wrong. Um, limit to the size of the array it'll render? I mean, will it render 100,000 rows? Or? I, yes. Uh, I haven't encountered a limit. Could blow up your memory Yeah, it, 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 just like Perl. You know, if you give Perl a million entries, have you got enough RAM? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a machine like that, too. Uh, <laughs> right, so as far as I know, there's no limits. Um, it, it pretty much is using Perl's arrays and ability to handle them and is iterating through them just like you or I would. It's just doing it deep so in the Perl module. It. Pretty much. Hash references. You stick a hash in your data set. You can... There's a, a function called keys you can use that gives you a loop. It gives you an array so you can loop over it and it'll print out all the items. You can also index into the hash by a, key, by a key, just by using a dot. It's kind of an, I know I have a slide for this later, but it's kind of an interesting th thing about template toolkit is there's all sorts of punctuation we use in Perl. When you want to go into a hash, you use an arrow. When you want to go into a hash ref, use an arrow and some curly brackets. When you want to call a method, it's, it's an arrow because it's a hash ref. But there's all sorts of things Template Toolkit doesn't. Everything it uses to separate variables from functions and parameters are all dots. So there's a bunch of places you'll look at and somehow it knows that's a variable calling a function. Really? Yep, I, I'm not quite sure how, but it, its parser is smart enough. So all the, 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 the glue punctuation it uses to put variables together are dots. You don't use a sigil, you don't use multiple characters, it just wants a dot. So there's lots of places where it's this dot, this dot, this dot, that. And Template Toolkit does the right thing. Um, the only downside is that it looks different than your Perl. But in some ways it's a little clearer than Perl. It lacks the expressivity. Um, so you can store a hash in your data item. You can store objects in your data item. Here's a more complicated example where I stick a URI object in. And I call methods on that URI to get data output. And you can just call any method that you have on your URI and it'll do the right thing. And if it returns junk, it'll print junk in your template. So you have to call URIs that do good stuff. But, you know, as string and scheme and host, those work. Those give you nice strings and here it'll print out nice strings. Uh, we're, we're the, when you want to create your template toolkit object, you'll need one. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You call new on it. It has a bunch of useful parameters. It's very configurable. You can make it case sensitive. You can make it strip white space. You can make it use different directories to search for templates. Uh, you can, you can um, control the characters it uses on either end to start and stop parsing. There, there's a bunch of stuff you can do to template toolkit. There's about a million initializers for new. I'm going to refer you to the Perl doc. Um, it's, it's very flexible. I'm sure you could do all, dig yourself into all sorts of holes with it. Generally, you need two options. And that's to tell it where your templates are and that you want to use interpolation. 
Uh, interpolated variables are the same as they are in Perl. You can say dollar whatever and it'll turn that into a string. Um, there's a couple of places where that's really handy where getting to it is just the variable name doesn't work. The parser can't tell it's a variable. So by using interpolation in that location, it does what you want. So those two are the most useful options. Um, and you'll notice I use find bin here to find my templates relative to my path. I always try and make my program work relative to itself so it's easy to move the whole directory structure around. You'd think I was on a Mac. Comes time to use your template toolkit object. You, you pretty much want to call process. It's a, it's a method on template toolkit called process. And you give it the name of the template and some variables. And it takes all those templates and processes them and spits it to standard out. And if you don't want it to go to standard out, because that's not always where you want it to go like most of the time, you give it a third variable. And that third variable can be a scalar, in which case it will put all the output in your scalar. It can be a file handle, in which case it will write it to the file. It can be a subroutine, in which case it will call the subroutine and pass the processed output as dollar, uh, as at underscore. Um, it, it's, it's very flexible. You can pretty much put anything in that third slot and call it, and it'll do pretty much the right thing. But you call process and say, go do that for me and it goes and does that for you. Generates all the output based on the template and the data you gave it. Uh, here's a bunch more details. How you format stuff, which I've already talked about. I knew I had a slide. How you get to items, there's the slide about the dot. And a bunch of the stuff you can do with template toolkit. Um, by default, the pars uses a square bracket and a percent sign and a percent sign and a square bracket as an opening and a closing indicator to denote what it's going to look at. You can change that as parameters to new if you really want to. You know, make it TH and ER and give it some English text and see what it does. Um, TT commands tend to be in uppercase. Again, you can change that if you want to, but it'll make everything a lot harder to parse. Variables will be in lower or mixed case. Mostly the variables come from your hash, so you are in charge of what the variables are. Um, commands can span multiple lines. You just hit enter in them. You don't have to put a backslash or anything to continue the line. Um, some commands have multiple lines where you say for each, that is a line, and then the things between for each and end are replicated for each for each loop. So end is, is closes off an item or a block. Everything closes with end. There's no end for, end if, end else. It's all just end. White space is a little funny. Um, white space matters and is left alone. So when you put in open template toolkit space something space percent square bracket, those spaces inside the square brackets are going to be left in your output. And, and that, for generating HTML, that doesn't usually matter. And so much of what we generate these days is HTML. It doesn't wind up mattering too much. Um, but if you're generating plain text or if you're generating a more rigid data structure, you'll have weird spaces everywhere. If you have a template toolkit line that evaluates to nothing, you'll get a blank line in your output. And again, HTML, nobody cares. but. It, it can matter. If you put a, a dash as the opening or closing character, it will eliminate that white space. If both of them are eliminated and the whole line is blank, the blank line is eliminated. You can control that default and turn it on with a parameter to new. And if you ever are producing something you intend to be human readable, I recommend you do so. Otherwise, you'll just be using three character openings on every item in your template. Um, a lot of what you produce is HTML, so nobody cares. And then the first time you produce something that isn't HTML, you'll be surprised. There's all these weird spacing and blanks. And as I say, HTML used to really bug me, but I've used this for other stuff, so I'm aware of all the weird spaces it puts in. Here's, here's my uh, slide about dots. Hash refs are accessed by separating the... Question. Yes. Like Absolutely. Well, maybe. Yes, apparently. <laughs> Okay, I said that if there's nothing, if you 
have like a blank, um, uh, blank um, square bracket percent, percent uh, square bracket there. You said that if that's blank, you actually generate a blank line from that? If you have a, a template toolkit item that evaluates to nothing. So if you have a variable that's empty, or if you're saying, if this is true, do this stuff, that all evaluates to nothing, and it doesn't put it in your template, but it leaves the blank lines that they were on. Are you talking about the end of line returns? It leaves the carriage returns, yeah. Oh, OK. So that when you look at your output, there'll be carriage returns in it for all the places that there was template toolkit markup that you didn't want in your output. OK, that makes sense. And these can help uh, squash that. And again, HTML, nobody cares. Um, accessing stuff is always done with a dot. You get to items inside hash refs, you call methods, you use their virtual methods, which we cover right at the end, so I have to hurry so we get there because they're cool. It's all dots, the template toolkit. I don't know why they made that decision, but once I got used to it, I couldn't complain. These templates, as they're being processed from top to bottom, actually behave something like a program. They have a control flow. They have if, they have for each, they have while, and they have switch. And you can access the data items and actually assign new data items, which I haven't talked about at all, and I will in a moment. But you can access the data items to uh, determine what gets output. I hope we don't have to spend too long on all the details of if and else, because everyone here should understand, you know, if else. But if you have a piece of data item um, that says, you know, tall equals zero, Oh, there's this. Look, uh, apparently I can't make a set of slides without an error. Uh, this should say if tall, not if count. I changed my example, can you tell? Um, if count will be false, it will, it will never print out that you're tall because you've never set count to true. Um, but basically, if this variable out of your data array evaluates to being true, then the if block will be interpolated and put in your output. Otherwise, the else block will be interpolated and put in your output. The else block is optional. You can skip it if you feel like it. Um, oh, no, look, look, I did get it right. Because there is no count in here. If count, it says you're not tall. Smarter than I thought. OK, um, also, I think that um, here is an example. OK, some of those items themselves won't really evaluate anything, and but there's the end of line character that follows right afterwards. Right, that's that's the end of line, the blank lines I'm talking about. If count, there isn't one. So this line will be, and and I skipped him out here, which is me thinking HTML. If count, you are tall. Else, none of those will put any output in your program. They're not true. They're not to be outputted, but they'll leave a blank line. The template toolkit commands are removed. The text that wasn't part of the selected output is removed. But the line feed is not. So there should be some blank lines here that I missed. So if you wanted to do that without the blank lines, you would put the if else You'd, command all on one line. Uh, actually, it's better to put the dashes. And that if, if there's dashes on both ends, it'll eliminate the blank lines, too. Uh, you can cram it all on one line, too. Isn't there also a, yeah, a flag on the... There is a flag to new that will do that, too. So you can say, just always eliminate the blanks because I don't care. And you can have it do that for you. Uh, but yes, that, that's, that's when it would accidentally leave blank lines, and my sample lost them. There's a for each, if you've got an array. Uh, if you've got an array, you can iterate over it. You get an array variable, and you can use that array variable in your output. Um, this is how you fill in tables and loops and draw big lists of things. Um, 
it's an incredibly useful construct. <coughs> while, everybody knows how a while loop works. While the condition is true, it keeps going. Um, here I've done something evil and written a function. Actually, I've written a method that returns one half 50% of the time. And I've blessed my data hash into my package, so it's an object, so that I could call the function in my while loop, and it'll print some of those, a random number of them, because it's calling rand in there. So you can actually call Perl functions from your template, do new work, and affect the output of the template. If you, you call those at process time? Yes. There's a switch case. You can give it a value and let it pick which block to display rather than doing if else, if else, if else, if else. Uh, switch case. We'll, oh boy, we get to go ahead. Um, several of these, if, while, even for each to some degree, use the same truthiness values as Perl. Undef, an empty string, or a zero is false. Anything else is true. Just like the you know, the, the items you're used to using in Perl. It does mean that if you have a list of digits and you have a number, you can accidentally stop on that digit when you didn't intend to. It can be a little <coughs> tricky. Template Toolkit allows you to take your template and split it apart into multiple components. You don't have to have one giant template that handles everything. In fact, you can split things way out into lots of little tiny pieces and then pull them in at need. Um, the, the two common ways you do this are to include an, ex, an external template toolkit file or you, you define a block which it uses like a function. Uh, the first thing you need to know is block and that defines a batch of template toolkit. And you define a block, you give it a name, and then you put some stuff in it. And there's no output. That's what that blank rectangle down there is. is there's no, it doesn't do anything in your template. It just says, okay, now I know what row does. And in row, it's got references to other template items. Those, we'll see what, which ones those are. Oh, yes, the end block is end. That is an absolute typo. Um, Good catch. <laughs> Always reassures me that people are paying attention when they find my typos. Um, so include is a template toolkit keyword that operates on a block or a file. That's not my least, that's not my favorite overload. You give it a block or a file and it processes all that output and does the template toolkit replacements on it and then gives you those results. Now, all my examples here just have it spit the results out into the stream of what it's generating. You can actually assign them to a variable, which you can then use later. So you can use a block, process a block, capture that output, and then do something with it later, including feeding it to other blocks. But if we have a block here that defines that same header row and then we define some data and then just include that row, it will spit out one entry of that row with this data in it. And here's the names, header and data. They match up the names, header and data that are in our, that are in our block. So include, we'll pull in an external file. If, if I gave it a, a file name here instead of, you can tell I copied that off the other slide. If I gave it a file name here instead of a block name, it would use that file as the source of as the source of template toolkit. And whatever a template toolkit actually has a scope. And when you're processing at the top level, you're in the global scope. All the things from your data structure are in that global scope. Include works at the global scope. So when you refer to stuff in include, it's using the raw items out of your data structure or everything. Everything, uh, any other variables you've defined. Process is just like include, except it defines a local scope, which means if you assign variables or change variables or call other blocks that assign or change variables, 
when your process statement is over, all those changes are thrown away. Now again, I haven't shown any examples here of using variables and creating complex data structures in the template. You absolutely can, and you can make a terrible can of worms and write spaghetti templates, and I am not showing them to you because I don't want you to. And you don't want to either because a year from now you will cry. I know I have those templates. Uh, but process works just like include. It has a scope of its own. Yes? Well, especially because I forgot to change the example when I copied and pasted the slide. Uh, <laughs> this should say process. This is, a, this is uh, making slides in a hurry. Uh, um, there's a third way to process blocks. And this is the one I wind up using the most. It's called wrapper. And it gives you a scope, just like process, and it lets you pass parameters. So you take a block that you've defined that uses parameters, and when wrapper uses them, those parameters don't point to the global scope anymore. They point to the items you've given wrapper when you called it. You define a block, and then you say inside my table I want you to put a row with sky and blue, and then I want you to put a row with trees and green. This becomes much more useful. Here's my table row if I want to swap the order of those columns or apply some styles or do whatever, I can do it in one place. And then it will generate the full table when you're done and a bunch of blank lines at the top. But you'd want to use the word wrapper instead of the word process, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I would. I'm not going to edit them here. That's too distracting. Yes, I would want to, I would want to use wrapper instead of process. How did I get the one from the wrong slide again? when I had it wrong on the first slide. I need a QA department. I need a QA department. Um, another feature template toolkit offers, which is very handy and easy to forget about, is a thing they call V met methods. They're virtual methods. They look like methods you can call and they stick them on every variable in the system. So scalars get them, but they're not as useful. Arrays get them and hashes get them. There's a, a huge list of them. But basically, you say variable dot method. There's a method to sort, for instance. So if you have an array in your data item, you can say sort that. And when you process that array with for each, they'll come out sorted sensibly, maybe. There's keys for hash refs. You can say hash ref dot keys dot sort and get all the keys out of the hash ref and then sort them. And then you do that in your for each block and it'll process them through in order. It's very handy, it saves a lot of time and effort, and means that you don't have to do all of that kind of preparation in your data building. You can let the layout and display code do that for you. There's a huge number of these virtual methods, so I'm gonna point you to the Perl docs on that. Um, as I said here, they can be changed, chained together, so you can call, you know, keys sort and, and get them to sort. Um, you know, Lambert, you warned me we had a, a, a time period, so I've been kind of hurrying. I'm going to be ahead. Uh, no, you still have time. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but this is, I think, almost the last slide. This is the slide that's too hard to read. Um, this is an actual template. Any of you who were, who were here for my Catalyst talk might remember that I had a big form Catalyst was displaying about a record collection. And that form, the actions for that form just built a data structure. They never said, draw it on the page this way. They gave it to this template. And this template says, do a bunch of rows. And it gives them data. And it gives them data out of the stash. And then we have a giant block that defines what a row looks like. And it prints the, it, the first item in the row is just the label. That's a very simple one. In every item, it has a name, and it prints out what the name is in a, in a, in a header. If, and it puts, there's, there's a, an item that I stuck in the stash called edit, which is true or false if the page is in edit mode. So if the page is in edit mode, it draws very different things. It does a whole bunch of extra work. If we're in edit mode, it does a bunch of work. Otherwise, 
it just spits out the value. So I use the same template on the display page and on the editor page, and I just don't care. I just say, yeah, include the template, I'm done. And the variable is set right in the data structure, so it, the page is responsible for doing the right thing. This big block of code checks if I have an item in my data structure for the item I'm editing, called rows and calls, or if I have an item called list, or otherwise just use an input. And these are it deciding, okay, if I have rows and calls, I want to use a character, what, what do they call that thing? A text area, a big place for you to put text in. If I've set a size in my data items, use the control that lets me take advantage of that. Otherwise, if there's a list defined, then I need to use a select list. And that list will be an array, and I generate the select list by pulling the data items out of the array itself. My code, my, my, my action in Catalyst, doesn't know about any of this HTML. It says, oh, list, there's an array ref. And that array ref by magic shows up in the, in the dropdowns on the form. Because this loop draws it when it says, oh, they gave me a list. I'm going to go draw a list. <coughs> the next choice here just says input name equals width and just lets them put in a tech, uh, you know, type in a box. Yeah. So you mentioned that wrapper took arguments. Yeah. And this includes your passing arguments. Is it basically the same thing? Uh, it's, it's basically doing the same thing. Is there a preference when you choose one or the other? Or are they alias? They have some differences as to which ones allow you to affect the global scope and which ones create a scope of their own and which ones use which sets of variables. And I'm going to have to refer you to the Perl doc because I always have to look it up. There, there are differences between include, process, and wrapper, but they're pretty minimal. In general, they say, take this block, go do stuff with it. So this piece of template generates that big form that allows you to edit all those different things with different form control types, different data types, different views and displays, and all the important names on the f of the fields, all the stuff to put in the drop downs, all of that came from the program which supplied it as a, a hash ref full of hash refs and, data and array refs. Complicated data structures which are extracted to turn into meaningful data. Now this has actually been real, real code that has actually run, so I'm sure it works. Um, and I'm wondering if anybody has any question or if you can read it at all. Go ahead. Um, so uh, you, you said something about uh, being able to change variables. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you do that? inside the process without exiting out of the, out of the template toolkit? For instance, if, could I run template toolkit and then one of its processes be open up a socket to something? Get all your data off of the socket and then, okay, I'm going to save some of this data and can you do RSS on it? Uh, because you can call Perl functions, Yes, you can do that. I don't know if it's a good idea, but you can do that. <laughs> different people want to solve different problems different ways. And what's a good idea for me is maybe what's different than a good idea for you. This, I know that anywhere you can give it a string, you can call a Perl function. So if you can write a Perl function to do the socket transfer you want and to get the data back out of those sockets and give it to you in a sensible data structure that Template Toolkit will like, then absolutely you can call the socket right in the middle of processing that page. Or processing that template, you may not be generating a page. Um, I will also say in another application I wrote, I, uh, I had to process a template and then make changes to it and process it again. So I had sub-templates that I would zip through Template Toolkit and then read in, build a big template structure, and then process the whole template structure. Um, 
and I can't remember why I had to do that, why I couldn't just use include. There was, there was a reason, but it, it hasn't stuck with me. So some things that sound like, why would you ever do that? There could absolutely be reasons. Why would you use template? Why would you process it twice rather than just letting template toolkit do it? Too bad I don't remember why. It was a bad design. I, I replaced it with Catalyst and that, then it got much better. I had written this whole complicated web framework that I was kind of maintaining and struggling with and at some point I realized Catalyst has solved all these problems. I'm going to throw away three quarters of my code. Oh, that's better. So uh, changing template libraries, I had to move from HTML template, which is the template library I used to a template toolkit to do that. So template toolkit was a rude awakening that day. Um, so you wind up, you can write really big complicated templates. You can write little functions that you use over and over and over. Uh, I, I had another example, and if I have time left, how much time do I have left, Lambert? Okay, um, you have 18 minutes. Oh, I might have time. I might be able to. I might be able to find you another example where I've used, uh, where we have some navigation on the left, and the 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 links for that navigation are all calculated in a block, and then based on which section you're in, the links are active or not. You can't click on the section you're already in. You can't navigate there. It's bigger in a different color. So again, you can do all that in a block, and but it wound, that project wound up being some complicated interleave templates, and I didn't I didn't think I could show it to you in two minutes. If I have 15, I might be able to. So that's that's a big template. This is real live code that you've some of you have actually seen run. And I'm at my last slide. This is what happens when I think, oh, I have to hurry. Go ahead. So. Why would you choose Template Toolkit over one of the other templating systems, like HTML Template or Mason or... Well, or um, at the end of the day, honestly, it boils down to there's more than one way to do it. You should tool choose the templating toolkit you like the best. I really liked HTML Template because when you did it right, you could, get, you could make it validate and run your whole template through the HTML validator and make sure everything would come out right. Yeah, and that's really cool, but it has some other limitations and some other things it doesn't do. It's um, less generic than template toolkit. And it's less generic. HTML template really wants to be working, well, you can do, use it for anything. You can. It looks funny, but you can. Yeah. That's not the way it wants to be, though. Right. Template toolkit is kind of generic already, so if you're not generating HTML, um, uh, we use it at the office. Uh, we have a complex system there's an understatement, that we give a set of rules defining, it's kind of like a make file. When you have parts of your system change, you have to take certain actions, and there's dependency ordering and other events that have to get started, and we build this big tree of what has to happen. And well, we have a bunch of rules that define those, and the language for those rules was incredibly simplistic, probably too simple. And somebody with a clue took Template Toolkit and wrote a little generator where you use Template Toolkit to define blocks that give you templates that you can apply to things. And then you use templates to set up your rules and then you process all that through and you get this big, long, really simple language that we actually support natively. And now, of course, we're looking at that and going, why didn't we just use Template Toolkit ourselves? and not have written our own lousy little parser, why didn't we do it this way in the first place? Because the guy who wrote the little parser didn't know about Template Toolkit. Yes, Lambert. I'd actually like to um, ask more in answer to Michael Friedman's question. Okay, which templating system should you actually should you pick? Okay, now, um, as before, okay, let me, let me backtrack just a bit. Okay, let me point out to you the commonality of all the templating systems. So what all templating systems agree on is that you want to separate the logic from the presentation. I can't agree with that. What? I don't agree with that. Okay. Well, at least that's kind of the, at least that's one thing they're trying to do there. Um, okay. That's that the reason why it passes a hash um, into the into the template. So it's. And that's the why I'd re that's the why I'd recommend you stay away from Mason, because you wind up with a template that has big blocks of Perl code smack in the middle of it. Mason can actually work both ways. Can it? Okay. You can do it 
with and separate the layers, but um, it's, it's designed so much more not to, to separate. Just stick the code in. There. Yeah. Yeah. So often I've seen it, you wind up with, and then congratulations, you're writing PHP except in Perl. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> you're writing in better PHP. Yeah. Uh, and there is documentation for Perl Ooh, he actually has, I only have a picture of the book. He brought it with him. <laughs> I saw what the topic was. So, I'm sorry, Lambert, I totally derailed you. Yeah, so what happens that, um, okay, what Louis actually said is actually correct. There is a really bad way to use templating systems, which is to mix the logic in with the presentation. If you're using the templating system, any templating system in the right way, you separate the logic from the presentation. Um, now, the difference between um, Template Toolkit and a lot of other templating systems is that in Template Toolkit, they actually add a, um, like a separate grammar. So it forces you to not use Perl code within your presentation. Mason itself is um, actually embeds Perl code in with your uh, in with the presentation, but you're still supposed to actually put your logic in another location. Okay, you're supposed to. It's really tempting to actually throw a bunch of logic in the presentation with with Mason, but you're not supposed to do that. Okay, with template template toolkit, it it really does force you to not have logic in the presentation. Okay. Some logic. <laughs> okay, there's okay, there's a little bit of logic. You can't you can't just run away from Logic altogether. It's, it's, there is, it's very complete. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, there's a bit of if else, yes, but they, but they don't want you to ask. They don't want you to have arbitrary access to the database. They don't want you to do forks. Uh, they don't want you to do. Uh, <laughs> fork. Oh, fork. Oh. Yeah. They don't want you to be calling web services or making JSON calls or I'm sorry, AJAX calls oh, and stuff like that from within your from within your. Um, within, your, within your presentation there. But you can. You can. If you actually, you have a, right, you have a virtual method, you can program your, okay, did we mention that you can program your own virtual methods with yes. Perl? Um, I actually didn't. Yeah. Um, you can, the, the virtual methods I talked about, there isn't one in this sample. They go way back here to the beginning, past all my errors, back to the clean template. This is actually a fairly complicated example of template toolkit. It has simple replacements, and it uses virtual methods in it. When it's going to produce the table it's uh, outputting, it wants to know the number of rows to fill in that for HTML so the screen can size properly ahead of time. I actually mostly did that because my original code did it. I, these days I'd ignore it. But to do that, it had to call keys. That's the IP addresses in my hash. And then call size to find out how many keys were in that hash. And size is what's going to be put back out into the quotation marks. And you'll notice I had to use the dashes there so that I didn't have extra spaces inside those quotes. They're somewhere mattered. Um, but these virtual methods, uh, you can write your own. They're actually pretty easy to write. And then so you can just call your own functions, make them do anything you want on any data item in your data array. Yes, there's a punch, or punch a big hole right through your uh, separation of uh, code and presentation. Uh, also, you can call methods. I had an example where I called a method on an object. So again, there it's going to go run your code. You can do anything you want there and go do your RSS reader or your data feed right in the middle of rendering your page. No, or your... There's nothing new about being allowed to shoot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it boils hey, down to. Card, it's been around for a long time. Right. So, if the language is sufficiently powerful enough, then you know, they have to let you do that. Well, if it's powerful enough to be useful, you can do that. Some languages make it harder not to. <laughs> yeah, but I loved C. Um, this, this, this sample actually has some logic right here in the page where it's using the data it's given to determine what to do with it. It kind of brushes up against, am I doing too much work in the template? I don't think it's doing too much work because the only decisions it's making are about what output to produce. What should I be putting on this page? Well, these things. It doesn't care about the data. It isn't adding or changing the data. It's just picking between, here's my data, which control type should that be in? And that means I didn't have to specify it in my code. It, it, this actually helped increase separation because the code that generates that data does a database query and does some calculations and sticks it in a hash and says, okay, I'm done. And it doesn't have to know way back there in my 
business logic, oh, by the way, that has to be a text area because it's big. It doesn't care. That's just listed up here because I gave it a, a rows and a columns somewhere. Description. Description. Because I set rows and columns, and I set that right there on the template. I didn't even pass that into the data item. So it's actually these data definitions that controlled which data types they are. I set them up here in the template itself. Is that too much processing on the template? Some say yes, some say no. You're looking for the happy medium that lets you get work done quickly without making a horrible mess you can't read later. I have some that are, have gone too far. This one's okay. So, uh, yes, keeping them separate is a good goal. HTML template does that, but it's much more limited. You can generate anything with this. Um, I've, I've used it, personally I've used it to generate web pages, to generate email. I insist on having a plain text part in an email message or it's not, doesn't meet the spec and can't be read on a bunch of people's devices. Um, actually, it's kind of fun sometimes if you want to blow people's mind to write the RTF part for Outlook. <laughs> um, you can really hurt people's brain. And then they see one thing in Outlook and everybody else sees something totally different. Um, so they open the message and it says, yeah, you suck, and everybody else gets something different. It's great. Um, so decisions, the whole point of having control flow and logic in template toolkit is so it can make decisions. But you don't want to put complex pro program logic there because it winds up being harder to maintain and, and your display and your, your business logic wind up getting intermingled. This is one of the layers of your uh, three-tier application. There's a phrase we don't hear too much anymore. It was all the vogue for a while. So that kind of brings up a question. Um, you know, we all try not to write bugs. But if you Except my call, slides. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're calling the method, there's a pretty good chance that that, 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 that chat wrote it. We have a, th a thing, and chat writes all the bugs. Oh, oh. <laughs> None of us do, it's chat. It's chat, right, right. So uh, chat wrote it, and it blows up, how does template toolkit handle it? It throws an exception in your code. And you catch it with die and say, oh my gosh, I couldn't render this page. Something went very bad. Um, how does any library handle bad data? Different ones handle it differently. Actually, many places, if you call a function and it dies, template toolkit will die. But if you're just doing data items, it uses all of the same rules Perl does. So if it gets an undef somewhere, it expects a string. It just says, yeah, it's an empty string, whatever. It doesn't even print warnings out all over the place the way Perl does with use strict turned on. What about just the simple thing of a syntax error? You get verbose output telling you, I couldn't make heads or tails of that. Um, it's usually pretty straightforward to figure out. Sometimes when you're including templates from templates from templates and have blocks running, it can be a little tricky, but no trickier than figuring out the syntax error in a moose role. <sighs> oh, <laughs> moose has a great thing called roles, and when you say, use this role, that use statement goes and incorporates the other file, so it processes it there, and you get about this much error spew if you have a typo in the role. And anybody who's done it will remember scrolling way back up to find at the top what the actual typo is. Sounds but like Java. Inspired by Java. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. What were some of the, the outputs, the different things? You said CDS and XML was not you any, Anything you want to out, any, any kind of formatted output you want to make, you can make with this. I've done tab sep with it, which was madness. Uh, <laughs> I've done comma separated, which was less mad, but still stupid. Uh, I've done XML, and it really wasn't that bad, but it was the world's simplest XML. Um, yeah, but I think your UTF-8 characters were probably. Almost certainly. Right now, I'm working in a world where spaces and file names are still controversial, so UTF-8 is so not on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> I actually checked some UTF-8 characters into Perforce just to see how many people at work I could make their heads explode. <laughs> I tell them, go sync this directory. And it's got all the files Perforce doesn't like and UTF-8 and all that stuff. And they, they just go away crying. 
Um, so yeah, it, I, it's a great thing to consider. Use the library for XML. Don't be stupid like I was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you can do lots of HTML with it, XHTML, same problem with XHTML. Um, problems with uh, HTML are that you do wind up writing HTML yourself, so if you're using something like CGI to generate your HTML, it's hard to do that for your in the middle of template toolkit. I suppose you could, but don't. Um, well, no, you just, that's a separate part, right? So you use CGI to create the template. Yeah, I suppose. Right? So, I've never actually liked CGI as HTML generators. It's a fabulous form parser, but I'll write my own. And this is how I do it these days. So, how's the performance of Tempo Toolkit versus like using CGI and FPM or um, straight print statements? You mentioned it can do caching of the template rendering, but it seems like it's doing a lot of work. And if you have simpler templates, uh, would it be overkill? I don't know. Pick the right tool for the job, though. You know, if you're going doing database output, this is should be the first thing you're considering. But you know, all those other examples, there's there's cases where you're not going to be the first thing you can say. Yeah. Um, and I honestly don't know. I haven't done a uh, speed comparison. I'm sure it has been done. Most of the places I'm using this these days are in the middle of Catalyst and lots of people will tell you how horrible and evil Catalyst is because if you have you ever turned on Perl tracing and started a Catalyst app you get about a million lines of output I'm not exaggerating it takes a long time to do the output there's just a huge number of libraries there and it totally doesn't matter because the first thing most modern web applications do is reach over the network and talk to a database so all that Perl interpolation is totally shorter than that one network connection over there. And so I don't know, does my template take longer to render? Maybe. It had to talk to that machine over there, so it's totally moot. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's data out there on it, but I don't have it. Lots of people like to ask that performance question. Um, I put performance off until the very end. The optimization is programmable. Yes, that's correct. Programmer yeah. time is very, very, very much more expensive mm -hmm. than server time. Uh, yep. Over millions and millions of transactions, yeah, okay, that's more expensive. But if you're not doing millions and millions, programmer time is cheaper. Right. It's cheaper to minimize programmer time. And, and what you often discover is in, unless you're building a system that's ginormous, I read a big article sometime back on how to optimize your web pages, and they were huge complicated, just daunting things. And I remember thinking, I'll never be able to do any of these. And then I read that they were talking about Yahoo's front page. Well, Yahoo's front page at that point was the home page of three quarters of the internet. It has to be able to send an enormous number of copies. Yes, transaction speed and transactions per second there are really important. And most of the places I'm talking about, I'm writing web pages for a mom and pop store. And as long as I can get the page up before the user gets pissed off and goes away, I win. And that's easy. So, the, the, I, I, performance is important, and I know this has tools to become more performant if I need them. I've never needed to turn them on or dig into it. And I will turn on the profiler and find out where I'm spending my time and go look at that piece of code first. And the key is that it is optimizable. Yes, you can make it better. I know that. There's all sorts of stuff in the manual pages. The manual page, is it going to let me do this? Uh, I don't have a network connected. Oh well. There probably is one here, but I'm not. I didn't set it up. <laughs> not on this machine. On my server at home, I have a local copy of CPAN. Uh, my phone's too small. I have a Nexus 4. But <laughs> Besides, I see him as an iPad app. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this web page, the Template Toolkit web page, has copies of all the Perl doc, as you'd expect. It also has actual manual pages. Perl doc is great reference material. And when you know, oh, I have to do this thing, it's called this, here's the options and here's the settings, it's all there. This actually has training materials to teach you through the logic and the thought behind it and a whole bunch of other information. And that's something that so many projects today are missing. 
and that you don't see anymore. These guys have a great pile of it, probably because they've been doing it for 10 years. Um, they have excellent examples. Um, the current version of Template Toolkit is checked into CPAN. It works with every version of Perl I've ever tried it on, ranging from active state 5.6 on Windows all the way up through Perl 5, what's current today, 16? 3, I'm behind. 5, 16, 3, I'm behind. But I've got it running on 5, 16, 1 on a Linux machine. It just, it just sings. It, it's been great. Um, there is an O'Reilly book. Ian brought one because he's that prepared. Uh, I've never actually read the O'Reilly book. And in many cases these days, I'm sorry, O'Reilly. With such good online documentation, the books just aren't as critical as they once were. Um, why buy programming Perl when you can type Perl doc? Yes? It is not part of the standard distribution. You will have to install it yourself. It is a well-behaved CPAN module. You can, ins you can either download the package and do make or Perl make file PL, make make, test, make, install. Also, there's packages on uh, the Debian derived or RPM derived Linux distros. I'm sure there are packages. Uh, and dependency light? Yeah, it's pretty dependency light. It's been around a long time, so it predates a lot of the dependencies people use now. It doesn't use Moose, so it doesn't need that. It doesn't use DBIX class. Uh, it also gets installed as a dependency to all sorts of other projects. You know, if you install Catalyst, you get template toolkit. Install well, a bunch of other things. Lots of things use template toolkit and will list it as a dependency. So, well, yeah, I feel like this was the template system I've been using. I've seen the things about uh, plugins. It has a bunch of plugins that are available for it. I'm sure there are some, but I've never had the need to even look at them. Some of the bridge methods? Between being able to call your own functions and um, there's a way, one of the things I didn't show you because it totally breaks. Uh, mixing code and uh, displays. You can actually, there's a kind of block you can just put Perl code in. So if you really want to scribble Perl on your templates, you can. Looks like everything it depends on is included in Perl. Oh, that's cool. Can you call it subroutines from within the template? While you're processing a template, you can call out to your Perl. Yes. Absolutely. So. Yes, and that, that's critical. That can be really Yeah. Can you, can you keep, you said, you said you could put a hash in there as your structure. Yes. Can you keep putting more hashes in Absolutely. There? You can build really complicated data structures and pass arrays of hashes of arrays of hashes and then break those out and hashes. hashes of hashes, all of it works great. And then either drill your way down with dots to get to the exact piece you need or, um, Oh, now I'm thinking of S and MP. I'm going to have nightmares. Um, my, my exact problem has always been I could create hashes of hashes inside there, but then I would lose how long it was. So when I would, I created just a loop to iterate through each item of hash, and then I'd wind up at the end always making a bad call because I always went a step further than was necessary to, to get out of my loop. Sure. And the whole problem was referencing what was there. If I knew exactly where it was, I could grab it. But if I just slurped in a bunch of data and I threw it in... Right. No, this, this, hash, this you can iterate down until you run out and then deal with what you've still got. But you're saying that it handles the error of not knowing how long the yes. arrays or not knowing absolutely. how deep the hash matches. Yes. You, you can absolutely solve that with Template Toolkit. Um, much like Perl itself, it's got it's very flexible when it comes to, you know, how am I reaching into arrays? So you will call a wrapper, uh, basically you'll recurse until you run out of items. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can recurse with templates. And by the way, the whole thing about the blank line at the end and just getting a blank, has yeah. always been one of my problems. And I just wrote a if statement to say that the line is blank, don't print it. Yeah. But I could never figure out why it was blank. So if, you're, if that explanation works, it's blown my mind. And, and you can also, there's a, uh, to new, you can just turn it off. Just say, don't do any of those blanks ever, and it'll eat them, it'll eat them all. So. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, 
Um, but any more questions? Uh, okay. Otherwise, we can move on to the election. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.